As you look on the screen, all the cookie lovers can recognize uh, who this is, the f famous Amos chocolate chip cookie. Now, for a lot of you, you may recognize the cookie, but the man is the Amos behind famous Amos. His name is actually Wally Amos. Uh, he was a talent agent in New York City and Los Angeles, and at the urging of some uh, well-known uh, entertainers and a little investment from them, he started his own, opened the first store for f uh, Famous Amos Cookies in 1975 in Los Angeles. I used to make the cookies for the entertainers, uh, for people he, was, uh, he had under contract, and that's how this all started. And although he no longer owns the company, uh, Kellogg does now, uh, they even own the Famous Amos name. He can't call himself Famous Amos anymore, uh, but everybody knows him. You know, uh, the cookies, you, you, we see them everywhere, and they just, you know, they just bring a lot of joy. I know they have to me uh, <laughs> over the years because I love a cookie. You know, it's one thing to be famous because of something good, uh, but... I mean, who doesn't like a chocolate chip cookie? Who doesn't like a man that smiles like that all the time? Uh, but it's another to be famous, a famous Amos, and not be liked, uh, to not be popular. Now, Amos, in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets, just like all the other prophets, showed up on the scene with a message from God. God sent them to deliver a, a certain message. The problem with the message that Amos brought to Israel was nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wanted to hear what he had to say. They couldn't believe what he was saying. Amos showed up in Israel about 800 B.C. Jeroboam is the king at this time. And everything was going great. The economy was great. They were not at war with anyone. The military was strong. People were so wealthy or wealthy enough that many of them owned two or three homes. They had a summer home and they had a, a winter home, a vacation home. Life was good. But then Amos shows up and he tells them things look good, but, you're, but it is ripe for destruction. One of the problems that, ha that had, was going against Amos is he was a southerner and he went up north to preach. And who up north wants to listen to a southerner? So, yeah. But that's, that was part of his problem. He came from the southern kingdom, went up to Israel. You know, no one wanted to listen. And I don't think even if he passed out bags of cookies, it would have made any difference. You know, we're going to move through the book of Amos, sort of like what we've done with the other minor prophets we've been preaching through. And it's an overview. If you read the whole book, you're going to learn a tremendous amount more than what I can share with you here in 25 minutes. But what we're going to kind of do uh, is an overview. It starts like this in Amos. Amos uh, shows up in Bethel. This is, a, a, this is a, uh, where a religious feast is taking place, so the city is full of people. And he begins to preach, and he starts by preaching against the nations that surround Israel. And he talks about their sins. And so it starts off very good because you know how it is. It's easy for us to listen to someone talk bad about somebody else. And so this is where it starts. And there's, I'm sure in the crowd there was a lot of amens. Mm -hmm. You tell them, Amos. Don't know who you are, but you're delivering a good message here because these people need to have to pay for their sins. But as God always teaches us, he does not skip over people and not hold them accountable for what they've done. And that's what we find in chapter 2. He talks about the sins of the people. Because God sent Amos specifically to speak to Israel, we're going to skip what he says to the other nations and go straight to Amos chapter 2, verse 6. Now, I'm going to jump around a lot of places, but if you want to uh, follow along in Amos, that's where we're going to spend our entire time. Amos chapter 2, verse 6 says this. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Now, if you've read uh, Amos, you notice that that's the way he starts every one of the nations that he pronounces a judgment on. says this very same thing. Three sins, even four. And, and what this really means is God, Amos is saying, speaking for God, saying, hey, I'm not jumping to conclusions here. 
I'm not talking, talking about something that just came into my mind. I'm talking about something you've been doing and you continue to do. It's a repeated thing that you're doing. And now you're going to have to take responsibility for it. You know, everything that God commands either in his laws or teaches us in his principles, Old Testament or New Testament, can be simplified and brought down to two things. How you treat God, how you treat people. What's your relationship to God? What's your relationship to people? Love God, love people. And this is no different here than what Amos is going. And what he's really going to spend most of his time on through this book, through this, preach, this sermon, is that he's talking about that you have neglected, you have royally messed up and how you treat each other. The economy was great for some people. But if you were a poor man... You were barely scratching out a living. The rich were taking advantage of the poor, even to the point that they couldn't live. Now, Israel and the Middle East had always had that if, if you owned a debt or if you wanted something that somebody else had, you, would, you could contract with them and say, hey, look, I'll work for you for two years, and that'll pay off my debt, or I can buy this land from you or whatever. I can do that. And that was an agreement that people made all the time. But what is apparent that has happened here is that people were forcing others to go into that type of servanthood, that type of slavery, and for ridiculous small amounts of money. That's why he mentions even a pair of sandals. I remember my grandpa Mills. Both of my grandfathers at one time or another worked in the coal mines of West Virginia. But I remember my grandpa Mills and my mom uh, talking about that working, you worked in the coal mines, but you lived in a house that the coal mines owned, and you rented from them, and all your shopping had to be done at a store that the coal mine owned. So they paid you, and you turned right around and gave it back to them. And you never, never got ahead. And as bad as that was, what Israel is doing here is much worse. Look at ch uh, chapter 2, verse 7, that very next verse. Amos says, he says, They trample on the heads of the poor as soon uh, as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. And most scholars believe that this means that the poor were treated, we will understand this phrase, they were treated like dirt. They were just treated like dirt. They were not a consideration. Justice is mentioned here and, <coughs> and certainly... Uh, most, Amos could be talking about in the court system, and you can imagine what kind of legal uh, representation they got. But it also just means, uh, scholars believe it can just mean that people, the poor, were just invisible. That you didn't get any consideration. If you weren't one of the elite, it was just like you weren't there, and you could do anything to a poor person that you wanted to. In the Bible, God sees this as a breach of justice. And this is very important. This is very important to realize this. You see, when we look at charity or, or helping the poor, we see it as charity. We see it as going above and beyond. It's like, wasn't that nice of me? Wasn't that nice of me to give my extra money? Wasn't that nice of me to give my clothes to this organization or to drop off some old toys? Wasn't that nice of me? God sees it. That's justice. He sees it as something that we are supposed to do. And if we don't, he says we are denying justice to him and to the people. He sees it as an extension of even who he is. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 18 says this. Speaking about God, he says, He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. He loves the alien, that's the stranger, the foreigner, giving him food and clothing. James in chapter 1 verse 27 says this, probably one of the best verses. He says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. If God has blessed you or I financially, it wasn't to insulate us from being poor. It wasn't to insulate us from the poor. It was to enable us to do more for the poor, to do more 
for spreading his word throughout the word to advance the kingdom. Listen to what Amos 4, 1, jump ahead to chapter 4. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husband, bring it, husbands, bring us some drinks. I cannot for the life of me understand why Amos wasn't a popular guy. I just can't figure it out. <laughs> this verse is just another way of Amos saying that how the people were living a self-indulgent lifestyle while people around them were starving, were dying, were being sold into slavery, and they were just saying, bring us another drink. Go back to, to chapter 2, verse 7. This, this wasn't the only sin that Amos is speaking against on God's behalf. Verse 7 again, if you go back at second half, says, Father and son used the same girl and so profane my holy name. What he's talking about here and what he's dealing with is the Old Testament sexual purity laws. God had specifically spelled out that a father and son were not to be sleeping with the same woman. That's mentioned in the New Testament too. You remember the church at Corinth. And this is just more of the charges that Amos is bringing is seeing and pointing out that they were so wrapped up in their own pleasures and, their, uh, and what brought them joy that they paid no attention to other people. They paid no attention to what God had already told them. Now, if we were in the crowd by this time, all the amens had stopped. And it either probably become uncomfortable to stand there or people were beginning to shout back at Amos. But it's not too hard for us to see the similarities and build a bridge between Israel and what we see happening in America today and in the world today. It's so easy for us to rant and rail against other people's sins. But how about what's when it's our sin? Let's ask the question. Would Amos have been welcomed in our churches? Would he have been invited back to speak? How would he have felt here? How many of the same sins that Amos spoke against do we see rampant in the Christian community? Do we spend everything on ourselves and only give a small percentage to help advance the kingdom and to help the poor? I'm not speaking one-to-one -one here, but when national averages say that people give a little less than 3% back, and God mentioned something about 10%, I believe, didn't he? Makes you wonder. When people have justified abortion for, by, by saying things like, well, it would mess up that young person's life to raise a child now. Or those people don't need another child in this world. Or it's just not a good time. How many Christians are ignoring what God has said to us about sexual intimacy between people before marriage? And even what we're doing in those roles after marriage. How many Christians in the churches across America worship God on Sunday, go back to work on Monday, and take part in immoral or unethical business practices, and we just call it making a living? But like most of us, Israel had some excuses. They had excuses for what was going on. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Amos 3, 1 and 2. Hear this word the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you, for all your sins. You know, Israel was in the, had the bad habit of saying and talking about, we're special. We're the sons of Abraham. We're your people, God. So they expected a, a special treatment for, uh, for being God's chosen people. And God is saying that's not an excuse. Look at five, chapter 5, verse 21. He says... And it's, it's such a strong statement. Amos says, I hate, I despise your religious feast. 
I cannot stand your assemblies. Remember, this is God speaking through Amos. Seven times in the book of Amos, God says, I hate your religious practices. And he names different things about them. In other words, Amos is talking to what we would say today, church-going people. He's talking to people who worship God. They still identified as followers of God. But God says, what you're doing is making me sick to my stomach. When your life doesn't match what you claim and what your worship is. And they lived under the delusion that as long as they went to temple when they were supposed to and they made the sacrifices they went to, they were supposed to and prayed the prayers they were supposed to and gave their tithes that they could do anything else they wanted. You know, for me personally, I love to sing praise and worship songs. I love the song choice this week. I loved us singing, it was a couple weeks ago at the end we sang, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus and Nazareth. And y'all just feel this building full of music. I love that. But I do not need to be fooled and you don't need to be fooled to think that by singing and repeating words to a song makes our life pleasing to God. If all we're doing is repeating words and get a little emotional on Sunday and we return Monday to a, a lifestyle like what we're talking about here, that is not pleasing to God. In other words, he says, it's not only not pleasing, it makes me sick. We are saved by grace, but we cannot excuse our behavior by grace or because of grace. You see, when you're a person of privilege, every person I've ever known, uh, and, and I'm calling ourselves people of privilege in case you haven't picked them, every person of privilege that I've ever known operates, one, they go one of two ways. If you're a person of privilege, you think you deserve special treatment, and that's how you live. Or you say, I'm a person of privilege, so therefore I have more to live up to. Because of who I am. And, and that's the difference. Now which one do you think God chooses? There was another excuse that they used that, that uh, Amos exposes here. And it's just as subtle and sneaky and innocent it seemingly as the other two. Look at chapter 6 verse 1. At chapter 6 verse 1. He says, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion and to... You who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Charles Spurgeon, in an old sermon, named three groups that are at ease or complacent or comfortable. He said they fall into three groups. The apathetic, I don't care. The self-indulgent, I care, but I care about me more. Or the procrastinator, I mean to do something, but I just haven't got around to it. Feeling good about things doesn't matter. It's aligning your heart and your desires and your emotions and your life and your actions with God. Jesus said the same thing. Remember when Jesus was telling the, the story about separating the sheep and the goats and he, he had the people and he said to one, he said, when I was hungry and thirsty and needing clothing, you did those things. And the others, he said, you, when I was hungry and thirsty, you didn't give me a thing. And they spoke up and said, when did we see you hungry and thirsty? Jesus didn't come back and says, oh, my bad. If you didn't recognize me, we're just going to let it go. No, Jesus said, wait, you saw the poor, the oppressed. You saw people who needed help every single day of your life, and you did nothing about it. And if you didn't do it for them, you didn't do it for me. That's the same thing that Jesus, that Amos was saying. You see, none of those were excuses were acceptable in Amos' day. They're not, they weren't acceptable when Jesus was physically walking on this earth. They're not acceptable now, and they won't be on, Jesus, on Judgment Day. There's so much more Amos is saying, but I want to try to tie this thing together of what Amos was challenging the people to do and what, of course, our challenge is today. Amos spells out what is going to happen as a result of this uh, unrepented sin of their part. 
I'm going to jump back to Amos 3.11. Yeah. Amos 3.11. <clears throat> Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun the land. He will pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. Now, this is one of the places that Amos says what's going to happen to Israel. He says it in several places, in several different ways, and, you, and gets more specific about it. He says that King Jeroboam is going to die by the sword. This is his clear warning to an entire nation. And like we said last week, when someone warns us of future consequences, it is not because they're, they're mean or evil, it's because they love us. It's the ultimate show of love when someone warns us of what's coming ahead. But there's always someone who will give you an alternate view, won't they? There's always somebody who will give you a different message if you don't like the one you're hearing. Who says you don't, you don't, uh, you, who says you don't need to listen to them? Everything is good. Pay no attention to this crazy guy. That person in this story is the priest of Bethel, Amaziah. Now, over, jumping again to Amos 7. At the end of all of this, you know, Amos, uh, Amos eyes had enough. Uh, Amos 7, verses 12 and 13. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. That's, or seer means preacher, prophet. He said, Get out, you prophet. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any longer or any more at Bethel. Because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amazon says, don't say that stuff anymore. We don't want to hear it. And I'm going to make sure nobody else has to hear it. My friends, we're living in the strangest time in my life. Now, I'm not going to say the strangest time in history because I, I don't know that. But in my life... This is the strangest time in my years on this earth. I grew up in, in small town America just like probably most of you. And there was always somebody, there was a neighbor or neighbors or family members who chose to live opposite of what God had shown us the way to live. And if they chose to live that way, they did. But the church had a message, God had a message, and we preached that, and we taught that, and people knew right and wrong. But people still, if they chose to live that way, they did. But today, it's not only that we choose, people choose to live that way, they want to silence anyone who says that's wrong to live that way. It's a strange time, my friends. What do you see Amaziah doing here? He's trying to silence any word that what we're doing is wrong. Now, this next verse is a, is a kind of brutal verse, but Amos answers back and says, Okay, Amaziah, Amaziah, this, if that's what you want to do, you want to stand on that side and oppose God, this is what God says is going to happen when the destruction of the land comes. What's going to happen to you, Amaziah? Amos 7, 17. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city. And this is probably because the economics is going to be so bad and she's not going to have a husband that that's what she had to resort to. And you and your, I mean, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up. You won't have any inheritance to leave, leave anybody. And you yourself will die in a pagan country. You'll be taken away from here in the exile. And Israel will certainly go into exile, away from their native land. My friends, I said we're living in a strange time. But the message is clear. You do not want to set yourself up in a lifestyle that is opposed to God. And you do not want to be the one who says, shut those people up. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that what I'm doing is a sin. 
you do not want to be on that side of the issue, that side of the aisle. Be very careful. Be very mindful. I'm talking to everybody from the youngest that are here to the very oldest. Please listen. Be very mindful. Be very careful which side you choose to place your allegiance. Don't choose a lifestyle that's not only against God. Do not defend that lifestyle before God. But here's the takeaway. I know you can see the similarities between Israel and America today, the world today. It's 3,000 years ago when he was saying this, but you can see the similarity. I know you can draw the conclusion that God does not overlook sin. It doesn't matter who we are. But he did send the warning. And our question today is left with this. Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the Amos are you going to listen to the truth that's still true in God's word? Or are you going to listen to the Amaziah in this life who says, don't listen to that. We know a better way. What you're doing is not wrong. Just keep on doing it. Everything's going to be fine. Who are you going to listen to? We're living in an age where we get 24-7 information, and that makes it difficult to listen. But who are you going to listen to? It's clear drawn in Amos, uh, Amos's day, and it's clear drawn in our day. Who, who you're going to listen to?